In the last theorem, we have seen that an equivalent martingale measure immediately implies that the underlying financial market model is free of arbitrage. So the question at hand is now the following. Is it also true that whenever we have given an arbitrage-free financial market model, that this implies immediately the existence of an equivalent martingale measure? If so, then we have a clear link between financial mathematics of the one, on the one hand and the theory of martingales on the other hand. And then you see why it makes sense that I presented to you all the theory of martingales before. So let us have a look at that. And the following theorem will give you a partial answer to that question. Namely, here I consider a D plus one dimensional arbitrage free financial market model where the time index sets consist only of two time points, namely zero and one. And that model is defined on our favorite probability space omega fp that I would like to equip with a filtration which is rather general. So I do not impose any restrictions neither on the sub-sigma algebra f0 nor on the sub-sigma algebra f1. And then this statement is the following. There exists uh, an equivalent probability measure q with the following properties. First of all, the random variables, the are devalued random variables of our discounted price process x0 and x1 are integrable. Second, the martingale property is satisfied, meaning that the conditional expectation of x1 given the sigma algebra f0 with respect to this probability measure q is equal to x0 q almost surely. And the third condition is that the density um, is a bounded function. So this theorem is true for general um, filtrations f0 and f1. Um, however, I would like to give a proof of that theorem in a particular case only, namely when the sigma algebra f0 is finitely generated. Let me remind you what that means. You find um, disjoint subsets b1 up to bn from our underlying abstract space omega in such a way that their union is equal to omega and that the filtration f0 is then generated by these subsets b1 up to bn. So what are the consequences of that assumption? So in, in case f0 is finitely generated and you consider an rd valued random variable y, then it holds true that y is f0 measurable if and only if there exists alpha 1 up to alpha n in the space rd such that you can write that random variable y as a linear combination of indicator functions of the sets bi. So meaning there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these um, uh, numbers alpha 1 and alpha n and uh, f0 measurable random variable. Or trace that differently, that the space of all f0 random uh, measurable random variables is isomorphic to the space r to the d times n d because our random variable variable y takes values in rd. So and now you see in the proof we are faced with constructing a certain subset of um, of that space of f0 measurable random variables. And this subset will turn out to be a convex subset and then we would like to apply so-called separation theorems and these are way more easier to prove in finite dimensional spaces than in infinite dimensional spaces. And that would be this general situation if we drop the assumption that F0 is finitely generated. Because then you immediately have to work with separation theorems in 
infinite dimensional space and meaning in function spaces. And this would lead uh, or force us to use methods from functional analysis and that I would like to avoid here uh, to give you a clean and um, uh, self-contained proof uh, of that first theorem. So that's why let us have a look now at that separation theorem. And I phrase that here as a lemma. So suppose you have given a subset C of some space on the LAN, and this set C should be non-empty, convex, and it should have the property that the zero is not contained in that set. And then it holds true that you can find a um, um, number y in Rn in such a way that the scalar product between y and x is non-negative for all points x in your convex set C, and that you find at least one point x not in your space in this convex set C, such that the scalar product between y and x not is strictly positive. So the proof is, goes as follows, uh, it, uh, we will consider two steps. But first of all, I would like to assume without loss of generality that the linear hull of our convex set C is a full space Rn, which is equivalent to saying that the interior of this set C is non-empty. Why I would like to assume that? Oh. Or can I assume that? Well, in case the linear hull is not the full space, then due to convexity, it is clear that this uh, set C should live if in an affine subspace of Rn. Meaning, this set C lives in a lower dimensional uh, space. So you can then first restrict by a suitable um, constructed mapping to a lower dimensional space and then you apply the results uh, which I would like to present now. So in the first step is the following. I would like to assume that the zero, which is by assumption not in the set C, is also not contained in the closure of the set C, meaning that the zero is also not a boundary point. So then I can do the following. Then I choose a closed ball um, centered at zero with radius r, where I choose a radius r in such a way that the intersection with the closure of our convex set is non-empty. So I have shown that situation over here. So here's our convex set C. Uh, here might be this zero point. Zero is not um, in C and also not in the boundary of C. It's clear outside. And then I can choose an array and centered ball um, with radius r in such a way that we have here non-empty intersection. So what do we know? Well, since um, this ball is a closed set and since the uh, closure of C is a closed set, the intersection is also a closed set. Moreover, that set is bounded clearly because we have chosen here a ball with a fixed radius, meaning we have here, so that green part here is a, con uh, is a compact set. And now I would like to consider the following map, namely that maps any point x from Rn to its Euclidean norm. And clearly that's a continuous function. And now since we have a convex set, we know that uh, a continuous function on a convex set um, assumes its minimum. So, and I would like to denote its minimum by y. So we find here point y in the intersection of the closed ball with our closure of the convex set, such that its norm is uh, less or equal than the minimum over all norms for x in our uh, in that intersection, meaning there is somewhere a point uh, which has the minimal length or minimal distance from the origin. What do we know? We also know that any point x which is in our convex set 
but not in our closed ball, has a norm which is larger than r. So this immediately implies that we have find um, um, a vector y in such a way that its norm is less than or equal than the norm of any point x in the closure of our convex set C. Okay, now what we know by assumption uh, that uh, C is a convex set, this immediately implies also that the closure is a convex set. Now we can do the following computation. So since the um, closure is a convex set, we know that any convex combination between our point of minimal length y and any other point x in uh, the closure of this, in this convex set C, which is again a convex set, um, is contained in that closure of the convex set. And that holds true for any lambda in 0, 1. So in that we would like to use alpha. Let's compute. What is the square of the norm of our vector y? Well, that we can abound from above. We know that this norm is less than the norm of any other point in um, our convex set, the closure of C. So let's write it down any other point in terms of that convex combination. And then I would like to uh, simply multiply out what we see here. So first of all, I can write lambda times x plus 1 minus lambda times y in the following form. That's nothing else but lambda uh, y coming from here uh, plus lambda times x minus 1. And from that vector, I take the 2 norm and then I squared. And if I multiply that out, then I get first of all the norm squared of this vector y plus 2 times the scalar product between y and lambda times x minus y. So that's the term over here. And the last term I get is simply the uh, 2 norm squared of the vector lambda times x minus y. And by homogeneity, I can take out lambda squared. So for any, and whenever lambda is uh, not, uh, is different from zero, I can now um, uh, solve that uh, or simplify that uh, inequality we have over here. Namely, this inequality is equivalent to the following inequality, namely that the vector, um, or this not vector, the scalar product, two times um, y scalar product between x minus y plus lambda times the norm x minus y squared is larger or equal to zero. You see that term over here drops and I can divide both sides by lambda if I assume that lambda is not zero. And now I can do the following. Now I can uh, perform the limit as lambda tends to zero and then I see the following. By doing so, you see that term drops out and I'm left with that first term is larger or equal to zero. So then I can solve that. So then I can bring uh, y times, uh, so the scalar product between y and y on the other side. And I obtain the following inequality that the two norm of y squared is less than or equal to the scalar product between x and y. And since y is, has to be different from zero because <laughs> we have assumed that zero is not contained in the closure of the set C. We also know that that vector or the length of that vector is strictly positive. So what we have proven here, we have proven the statement, namely, let's go back. We have find a vector y such that the scalar product is non-negative for all points x in our convex set, which is here the closure of that set C. And we have seen also that any point is strictly, as uh, a scalar product between any point of the set C is strictly positive. 
So even we have a uh, strong statement here. And that's the reason is that the point zero is not at the boundary of our set C. So we should treat that case now. So we assume that zero is not contained in the set C, but zero might be in the closure of the set C. So meaning here the zero point sits on that boundary <coughs> and assume that this boundary point at that particular case is stage is not um, contained in C. And then I would like to consider the following sets uh, Cj, which are defined in the following way. So I take a ball around zero with radius j, so that's again the closed ball, and I intersect that with all the points in the interior of the set C, which are a distance 1 over j away from the complement of the interior of the set C. So that's the following. You take away that boundary. Then you um, consider the closure of that set. So that's everything which is outside of C, including the boundary. And then you go away from that set a distance 1 over j. So that's here written as that green bit part. And then I take the intersection with that ball. So what are the consequences? So since we know by assumptions our set C, the linear half of that is uh, the full space, we also know that the interior of that set C is non-empty, meaning uh, immediately implying that all these sets Cj are non-empty and moreover zero is contained in none of these sets Cj because we have that security difference between um, the sets Cj and uh, the point zero. So meaning now we can also take, so we also know that we can also take the closure of these sets Cj and we know that also the closure of these sets Cj are not containing the point zero. Okay, so that we have seen now. So this means we can apply the step one where we have treated the situation when zero is not contained in a, a convex set C which is closed. So meaning in that for any j, we find now a yj of minimal length such that the scalar product between x and yj is strictly positive, so this we have seen over here, for any point x in that set cj. So, and you see clearly we can normalize the length of that uh, vector uh, yj such that it's uh, Euclidean norm is equal to 1. So meaning we have now here constructed in that way a sequence of, um, uh, of vectors which lives in this, on the surface of um, d minus 1 dimensional unit sphere. We know that this d minus 1 dimensional unit sphere is a compact set. Uh, side remark, that's not true anymore in the infinite dimension. Um, so now we can apply um, Bolzano-Weierstrass, which tells us that we can um, extract a subsequence of this sequence uh, yj, which I would like to denote by yjk, such that yjk converges to some vector y. So and that with that object, with that vector y, I would like to work now. So we know the length of that vector y is, has Euclidean norm 1 by construction. And we also know that the scalar product between x and z constructed y is the same as the limit as k tends to infinity of x times um, this uh, element y, j, k. And uh, what we have seen from the proof before that that scalar product 
is um, non-negative for all points x in the interior of the set C. And now we can also pass to the boundary points of that set C. Meaning, you also know that for any x in our set C, um, this inequality holds true. But here's not a strict inequality anymore, but we have just a larger equal. So, um, and what do we also know? Well, um, since the length of y has no one, and we know that the interior of our convex set is non-empty, we know that the scalar product x times y cannot be zero for all points x um, uh, in our uh, convex set C, because it would immediately mean that uh, this convex set C lives in an affine um, subspace of our space Rn, and the linear hull of that set would then be in a, a hyperplane, and this be excluded, excluded by assumption at the beginning of the proof. So this immediately implies that there exists at least one point x not in our set C, such that the scalar product is also strictly positive, and this then concludes the proof. Okay, so once we have now our tool at hand, and this is version of the separation theorem, let us now address the proof of theorem 2.9, in case that f not is finally generated. So what do we know? First of all, by uh, theorem 2.4, we know that the arbitrage freeness of a financial market model S bar is equivalent to the existence of a random variable eta, which is F0 measurable, such that the scalar product between eta and as the difference between x1 minus x0 is larger or equal to 0, p almost surely. And if, if you find such a um, uh, random variable eta, it immediately implies that that scalar product has to be equal, p almost surely. Why? Well, suppose that thing um, is uh, strictly positive with positive probability, then by theorem 2.4, it would immediately imply that our financial market uh, admits an arbitrage opportunity. So that's one direction, and the other direction is um, also clear from theorem 2.4. Okay, so let us now come to step one. And in step one, I would like to assume that the random variables x0 and x1, so the values of our discounted price process, are bounded random variables. Why I would like to assume that? Well, you see, once you know that these random variables are bounded, you have not to worry about um, integrability issues with respect to any probability measure um, and which is defined on our uh, measurable space omega f. So what we would like to show, show now is the following. That there exists an equivalent probability measure q with bounded density, and the density is here written in terms of the random Nicodium derivative, such that the condition expectation of x1 given f0 with respect to that measure q is equal to x0 Q almost surely. So that suffices. The integrability is ruled out by that assumption. So, and we proceed as follows. We first define the following set C, which is simply given as um, the conditional expectation of the difference between x0 and x0 uh, given f0 with respect to um, a measure Q. And you see clearly that by the definition of a conditional expectation, notice here we use again the boundedness of the random variable, and that this conditional expectation is nothing else but an F0 measurable random variable. And the Q, which appears over here, should be any 
probability measure Q, which is equivalent to P, and which has bounded density. So what do we know now? Well, here we, at that stage, we take advantage of the fact that our sigma algebra F0 is finitely generated. Namely, by the remark we had before the proof of the separation lemma, we know that the set of all F0 measurable random variables in case F0 is finitely generated is isomorphic to some space Rn. And here, in this particular situation, um, if our sigma algebra F0 is generated by these sets P1 up to P capital N, then the C is isomorphic to a subset of the space R to the D times N. Hence, we can now apply our, oh, we cannot apply now, but we should check that that, say, that C is a convex set. And this I would like to do now. So for that purpose, I would like to consider first two probability measures, Q1 and Q2, which should be absolutely continuous with respect to P and which have bounded um, densities. And then I would like to define for any alpha in the interval 0, 1, the following probability measure, namely Q alpha, which is simply the convex combination of these probability measures Q1 and Q2. And clearly, Q alpha is a probability measure. And moreover, we also know, since Q1 is absolutely continuous with respect to P, and the same holds true for Q2, we also know that Q alpha is absolutely continuous with respect to P. And moreover, its bound density can be written in terms of the density of the measure Q1 and the density of the measure Q2. And since we know that these two densities are bounded, so meaning these are bounded functions, also the convex combination is a bounded function. Hence, we have here constructed as well um, an equivalent measure as a measure Q alpha, which is equivalent with respect to uh, P, which has bounded density. So all these following random variables, namely the condition and expectation of this difference with respect to F0 under this measure Q1, Q2, or Q alpha are contained in the set C by the definition of the set C. So what I would like to consider now is for any set A um, in our sigma algebra F0, I would like to perform the following computation. Namely, I would like to consider the condition and expectation, uh, no, the expectation with respect to this measure Q alpha of the indicator function of the difference between x1 and x0. So the aim of that computation is to show that the uh, convex combination of that random variable and that random variable equals, with the parameter alpha, equals to the random variable given by that measure Q alpha. So let us have a look at that. So I would like in a, to rewrite that um, expectation first uh, in terms of the expectation with respect to the probability measure P. And this I can do if I include here the density um, of um, uh, this uh, measure Q, uh, Q alpha with respect to P. And now I would like to plug in at that stage uh, the explicit representation in terms of the measure Q1 and Q2. So this is the safe one here. Then I would like to use simply a linearity to write that expectation as a sum of two expectations. And I would like to use also um, uh, that I can take out this constant alpha and one minus alpha from the expected value. And then I can rewrite again that um, expectation with respect to the measure P in terms of the expectation of the measure Q1 and the expectation of the measure Q2. And this is done over here. 
So and since um, so from that com computation over here, you can immediately conclude um, that the conditional expectation of uh, that difference was uh, given the sigma algebra f not multiplied with alpha plus the conditional expectation of this difference given f not with respect to the measure q2 multiplied by the um, value 1 minus alpha equals the conditional expectation of um, um, q alpha uh, of this difference given f0. And since we know that that element over here is contained in the set C, and since that holds true for any alpha in 0, 1, uh, we conclude that also the convex combinations from elements of that set C is contained in the set C, and this shows clearly that the set C is a convex um, subset of all F uh, zero measurable random variables. And now we can apply the separation lemma. So we would like to show that the, the zero function or this, this huge zero vector um, is contained in that set C. So why we are after that statement? So have a look at that um, definition. So when we know that the zero function is contained in that set C, then we immediately know that there exists some measure Q that says this random variable is equal to the zero function. Yeah. And from that, we have then proven the Martingale property. So that's why we are interested in that statement. So. And here we would like to prove or uh, perform a proof by contradiction. So we assume that zero is not contained in that set and this convex and non-empty set C. And you see then we can apply lemma 2.10, which tells us that there exists an F0 measurable bounded random variable eta um, such that for any uh, probability measure Q, uh, which is equivalent to P with bounded density, the following scalar product, I mean the scalar product between eta and the conditional expectation of the difference between x1 and f, x0 given the sigma algebra f0 under that measure Q is um, non negative. So how does, is that uh, related with this lemma um, 2.10? Well, you see, 2.10 gives us a vector uh, y, and we, from the proof we know that this is norm of the vector y, we can also assume to be equal to 1. So this is our bounded vector 1. So then we have seen that vector 1, we can, by the remark we had before the, the proof, so you can uh, rewrite that in terms of an um, y0, uh, f0 random measurable random variable, and that's exactly our eta here. And that object over here plays the role of the x, which should be in the convex set from the previous lemma. So that's first the first part of the statement. And you see, since this eta is f0 measurable, I can also write that product over here as the conditional expectation of the product, the scalar product between eta and uh, x1 uh, minus x0, given f0 under the measure q, that this is larger and equal to 0. And the second part of the statement from lemma 2.10 was the following, that there exists also some uh, probability measure q0, which is equivalent to P with bounded density, such that the following conditional expectation is strictly positive. So what do we want to conclude from these two assertions? First of all, I would like to show that uh, knowing 
is that this um, condition expectation is non-negative, it should also apply that this random variable here is non-negative p almost truly. So why is that the case? For that purpose, let us consider a set A, which is simply defined as a set of all omegas, such that the scalar product of uh, eta omega times this difference between x1 omega minus x0 omega is strictly negative. And clearly that's um, um, this set here is measurable and contained in the sigma algebra f because um, eta is a measurable random variable so it's a random variable and that's the difference of two random variables and moreover i would like to define this phi n in the following way that's one minus one over n times the indicator function of the set a plus one over n times the indicator function of the set a complement and this I can define for any n in the natural numbers. And further, I would like to define um, a probability measure Qn by the following formula. So Qn of an event A is simply defined as uh, the expectation under this measure P of the indicator function of the event A times phi n divided by the expectation of phi n under p. So what do we know? First of all, since uh, phi n is um, non-negative, you immediately see here that that object over here gives rise indeed to probability measures. So if you plug in here um, omega, then you see that uh, the expectation is equal to 1, and since this object, this phi is non negative, we also have here that serves as a kind of density. What do we know? Uh, we also know more. We also know that phi n is strictly positive. And that's the reason why we included here not only a, but also a complement. So not these two can have probability. Um, Zero. So if you plug in an omega here, one of these two functions has have to be one. And what do we also know? Um, so we also know that the expectation of this phi n is contained in the interval uh, one over n and n. So why is that the case? Well, uh, let us have a look at that function phi n. Clearly, this function phi n is bounded from above by 1. So you simply can replace the indicator function by 1 and the indicator function of a complement also by 1, and then you see this sums up to 1. And as for a lower bound, you can do now the following. Um, you simply uh, consider two different cases, namely the case n equal to 1 and the case n larger equal to 1. And then you see over here that in case um, that you can rewrite that indicator function over here in terms of 1 uh, minus the indicator function of the complement. And or you can do it, it's, maybe it's better to rewrite that indicator function as 1 minus the indicator function of the set A. By this 1, you get exactly this 1 over n here. And what you are left with is minus the uh, minus 1 over n times the indicator function of the set A. So you get over here simply the expression uh, 1 minus 2 over n times the indicator function of that set A. And this term you simply drop. And that's why you see. Um, so the, you can drop that in case that n is larger or equal to um, 1 because then you know that the prefactor 1 minus 2 over n is uh, non-negative and then you get exactly that lower bound 1 over n. Okay, good. And you see in case n is equal to 1 then this statement is trivial because that term is not there. We have simply here a 1, and then you can bound this term from below by 1 over n. 
if it was in a smart way. <laughs> so what we have seen here, uh, we also know that this from that condition over here, that um, this probability measure Qn is absolutely continuous with respect to P and the bound and uh, the density is bounded. So why is that the case? So first of all, by definition, you know that Qn um, is absolutely continuous with respect to P. So, and moreover, you also know that the density Qn divided by, uh, so dQn over dP, which is nothing else but phi n uh, divided by the expectation of phi n, that object over here is positive, p almost surely, and now you can apply theorem 1.8, which tells you then that qn is not only absolute continuous with respect to p, but that also qn is equivalent to p, and the finiteness of the density follows simply from that ob observation over here, that namely the expectation of phi n is contained in that interval, and also that phi n uh, is bounded from above and below. Okay, so now we have constructed that measure Qn. So what to do with that? Well, let's do now the following computation. So I would like to compute um, the, con the expectation of the conditional expectation of eta times uh, x 1 minus x0 given f0. So since we know by that assumption over here that this conditional expectation is non-negative for any q which is absolutely continuous with respect to p and which has a bounded density, it follows that that expectation over here is non-negative. So using the properties of conditional expectations, this simplifies to the expectation of uh, under this measure qn of the scalar product between eta and the difference between x1 and x0. And this now I would like to rewrite in terms of um, the expectation with respect to the measure p. And in order to do so, I have to include the density in the expectation. So now you see I can take the normalization factor out from that expectation and then it immediately follows that we have the following statement, namely that the expectation with respect to the measure P um, of the scalar product between eta and the difference x1 and x0 multiplied by this function phi n is larger or equal to zero. On the other hand, we know that this function phi n converges p almost surely uh, to this to the indicator function of the set A. You see here this follows simply by definition. So if n tends to infinity, that term uh, vanishes and you converge to the indicator function of A. But the indicator function of A is nothing else by definition of this def of this set A as the scalar product. Uh, as the event that the scalar product between eta and x1 minus x0 is um, strictly negative. So, and since we know that by assumption um, both random variables x1 and x0 are bounded and also eta is bounded, that scalar product is a bounded value. So, meaning we can apply Lebesgue's um, dominated conversion theorem because we have no issues with integrability here at all. So this means that the expectation with respect to this measure p of the scalar product between eta and x minus uh, x1 minus x0 times the indicator function of the set A, which is nothing else but the scalar product between eta and x1 minus x0 being less than zero is equal to the limit, as n tends to infinity, of the expectation under the measure p of the scalar product between eta and the difference of this uh, discounted price processes at time point 1 and 0, multiplied by this function phi n. But we have seen 
from that observation over here that each element um, in this uh, sequence is non-negative. So hence we have obtained that that expectation is larger or equal to zero. However, on z event over here, z random variable is strictly negative. So the only uh, possibility that z expectation takes a value which is larger or equal to zero is that the probability of this event over here has to be zero. Hence, we have proven that the probability of the scalar product between eta and x1 minus x0 um, is less than zero with zero probability or going to the uh, complement we have proven that the scalar product between eta and x1 minus x0 is larger or equal to zero p almost sure so that was part one now the next step i would like to show is that the probability of the event that eta times um, x1 minus x0 takes a value which is strictly positive has positive probability. So now we take advantage of the second um, um, implication of lemma 2.10. Namely, by that we know that there exists some probability measure q0 which is absolutely uh, which is equivalent to p with bounded density such that the conditional expectation of the scalar product between eta and x1 minus x0 given f0 under this measure q0 is uh, strictly positive. So um, we get from that observation here the following um, statement um, about its expected value. Namely, if we compute now the expected value of the scalar product between eta and x1 minus x0 under this uh, probability measure q0 and by lemma by the assertion of all the implication of lemma 2.0 we know that this random variable inside the expectation is non-negative um, uh, q0 almost surely so that's the same as the expectation of the condition expectation and by assumption uh, or by the assertion of lemma 2.10 we know that that random variable here is strictly positive so using the monotonicity of the expectation q0 we um, obtain that that expectation over here is strictly positive so this implies since these random variables here are non negative that the probability of the event that the scalar product is uh, strictly positive has positive probability and since q0 is equivalent to p this also means that the probability that this event has a positive probability um, holds true so but now we can take advantage of theorem 2.4 which tells us that in, in a situation when the scalar product between eta and x1 minus x0 is larger or equal to 0p almost surely and the probability that it takes a value which is strictly positive with positive probability holds true, then this financial market model admits an arbitrage opportunity. But that's in contradiction with our assumption that our underlying financial market is free of arbitrage. Hence, our assumption we, uh, we imposed here, namely that zero is not contained in this convex set C, has to be false. And by that, we have proven that um, zero is an element of this set C, meaning that um, the space of equivalent martingale measure is non-empty. And by construction, we also know that the corresponding density of one of these equivalent martingale measures um, is a bounded function. So this was step one. 
uh, and remember in step one we assumed that the random variables x0 and x1 are bounded random variables and that was crucial in the proof at various stages we used uh, that so what to do in a situation when this is not the case and that for that purpose i would like to introduce the following new random variables which i would like to denote by x twiddle t so then that's defined simply as xt divided by 1 plus uh, the norm of x0 plus the norm of x1 and here you can choose whatever norm you want for instance the Euclidean norm so the two norm I mean so and define that random variable for any t in 0 1 and clearly these random variables are bounded so <laughs> they are bounded from above by uh, by 1 and from below by minus 1 um, so and uh, in particular since the uh, financial market model uh, as bar is free of arbitrage then it also holds true now this is then equivalent to the statement that for all f0 measurable random variables eta uh, whenever we know that the scalar product between eta and the difference of x1 twiddle and x0 twiddle is larger or equal to 0 p almost truly that this has to imply that the scalar product is actually equal to 0 p almost truly and that's the same reasoning we did before and the point is that this normalization which we used over here does not play any role in that statement Okay, so meaning um, that we can now apply um, step one to that random variables x twiddle zero and x twiddle one, which tells us that there exists a probability measure, and let's call that q twiddle, which has bounded density such that the condition expectation uh, of x twiddle one given f naught under this measure q twiddle is equal to x0 twiddle q twiddle almost two meaning the martingale property is satisfied so and now we have uh, to say something about uh, how to come up with our uh, candidate of an equivalent martingale measure so we define a measure q of any event a taken from our sigma algebra f in the following way that's simply the uh, expectation with respect to the measure p of the indicator function of the set a times this function phi and this function phi is now chosen in the following way so that's the ratio of the inverse of one plus the norm of x naught plus the norm of x1 divided by the expectation under q twiddle of that random variable which appears over here multiplied by the density of q twiddle with respect to p so what do we know so by that statement over here we first of all know that that function is a bounded function and um, we also know that the expectation of this function phi with respect to p is equal to 1. Why is that the case? You see, if you compute the expectation of phi with respect to p, then you can rewrite that as an expectation of that term over here with respect to q twiddle, and then you see you take that out from the expectation with respect to q twiddle, and you get, get here the expectation with respect to q twiddle of that random variable, but then you see it cancels out and you get exactly 1. So meaning, Indeed, this Q we defined here is a probability measure. And by definition, we know that Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P. So what do we want to show now is that not Q is not only absolutely continuous with respect to P, but that Q is also equivalent to P. So using that Q twiddle is equivalent to P by by the assertion of step one, 
we know that this density over here is not only a bounded function, but by theorem 1.8, it is also this um, density takes also a strictly positive values um, p almost surely. So what else do we know? We also know that uh, these random variables here take values in Rd, meaning these norms are finite p almost surely. Um, and we also know that the expectation of this random variable over here under this measure q twiddle is bounded from above by 1. Why? Well, simply drop these two uh, non-negative terms and then you end up with 1. So this immediately implies that this function phi over here um, is strictly positive p almost surely because you can bound that term here from above by 1. We know that that term over here is um, positive p almost surely and we also know that that random variable over here is um, by that observation uh, is uh, positive almost surely. Hence we can again apply um, theorem 1.8 which then tells me since that density here is positive p almost surely, this was equivalent on, together with that fact that, um, that q is an equivalent measure with respect to p. Good. So what else do we know? So we also know uh, that there exists some value k uh, chosen as a real number larger than zero, which we can choose in such a way that the q twiddle prob um, probability of the event that's the norm of x0 plus the norm of x1 takes a value which is less than or equal to k, has a pro uh, probability which is larger or equal to one half. So why do we find that um, such a value k? So we know that these random variables over here are finite p almost surely and we also know p is equivalent to q so meaning that this event over here is um, the, it's a q twiddle probability of that event over here is equal to one meaning if you choose in k large enough you can always um, ensure that this probability is larger than one half so what is the consequence of that? So, well, we now know that the expectation of this random variable over here under this measure q twiddle, if we take the inverse of that, we can bound that from above by writing, including here the indicator function that x0 plus x1, the norm of these random variables, is less than or equal to k. So then we get an upper bound by simply saying, well, I get an upper bound if I make these two random variables larger, because with this minus sign I get something which is smaller, but with this minus sign over here I get something which is larger again. So replacing these two things simply by k, we can take that out. So this gives me then simply that um, factor 1 plus k and then we I'm left with the q twiddle probability of that event over here but this we have seen by the choice of k that this is bounded from below by one half meaning that that object over here is bounded from above then by two times 1 plus k which is clearly fine and I would like to use the finiteness of that quantity which comes from the definition of that measure phi. So you see that in the denominator. I have to treat that. Okay. So meaning we now know that phi is a bounded function. And what I would like to convince myself that this measure q we defined so far um, uh, is a candidate of our equivalent Martingale measure. So meaning I have to check two things. First of all, I have to check that the discounted value process 
is integrable with respect to that measure q and that the martingale property holds true uh, under this measure q so let us start with the um, with the integrability so uh, let us compute the expectation of um, the modulus of x t i with respect to this measure q so this i can first write in terms of the expectation of this random variable x modulus of x t i under this measure p by including the corresponding density phi so now i take uh, i simply plug in the definition of phi so you see i can take out that term over here which was simply that normalization constant and i can rewrite everything then in terms of this measure q twiddle taking advantage of that density over here good so i'm left with that normalization factor and the expectation under q twiddle of this ratio but now you clearly see that random variable inside here is bounded from above by one meaning i'm left with uh, an upper bound which involves only the expectation of that random variable and uh, that number over here but by that computation we did before we know that this number is bounded from above by uh, by two times one plus k which is clearly finite so hence we have shown the finiteness of that random variable under or the modulus of that random variable under um, this measure q and that holds true for any i and any time point t in zero one meaning we have checked the integrability uh, property of a martingale so now let us come to the martingale property so and for that i would like to compute as a conditional expectation of this difference between x1 and x0 uh, with respect to the filtration f0 under this measure q and we have seen that we can rewrite that conditional expectation using the defining properties of conditional expectation in terms of the conditional expectation uh, with respect to p of the random variable x1 minus x0 times phi given f0. So how do you convince yourself that that is true? Well, by the second property of the definition of conditional expectation, you know that you can rewrite that for any event A taken from the sigma algebra F0. You multiply that random variable with the indicator function of that set A, and you take the um, expectation with respect to Q. And then you can rewrite uh, everything in terms of uh, this density, and in that way you get out exactly that condition expectation with respect to the measure p good so let us now plug in the definition of phi and let us take out so the constant so that's the constant i can take that out and then i can also take advantage of the fact of that density over here which allows me to also rewrite everything in terms of the condition expectation now with respect to q twiddle and you see i have here this normalization but this normalization i now use to rewrite the xi's which i have here in terms of the xi twiddle or, or this x um, t twiddle so in that way i get that condition expectation by, but by the definition of q twiddle i know that that thing over here is equal to zero because q twiddle is a martingale measure and exactly in that step in, step in order to rewrite that i also took advantage of the fact that that quantity here is um, a bounded function such that the integrability is not um, destroyed so we convinced ourselves that indeed uh, our q we defined on the last slide is an element from m star and that now concludes the proof 
So here's a, now a tiny example. So consider for a moment um, one period financial market, which consists only of this risk-free security and one risky security. And I would like to assume that we start from the value 1, 1 and this um, risk-free um, um, security evolves at time 1 in the following way, namely it takes the value 1 plus r, where you can interpret r as some interest rate which should here simply take a value which is larger than minus 1. And the only random variable is then the value S11. And here, let me assume for a moment that S11 takes values in this finite set S1 up to SK. So in the sigma algebra, I would like to consider here now the trivial sigma algebra consisting simply of the uh, empty set in the full space and the sigma algebra at 10.1 is simply the sigma algebra generated by uh, S0 and S1. So clearly it's just generated by S1. So and I would like to assume in addition that the probability measure with which we equip our measurable space of omega F or that filtered space has a property that these random variables that S 1, 1 takes the value SI with a um, positive probability for each uh, i from 1 to k. So, and then by uh, this theorem 2.9, um, this financial market model is arbitrage free if um, uh, this uh, set of equivalent martingale measures is non-empty. So that is that there exists uh, this uh, a measure Q in such a way that first of all these things are integrable and the martingale condition is satisfied. And here we can write out that explicitly. So what properties should that measure Q satisfy? So first of all we would like to have that um, the probability, the Q probability of this event that S11 takes the value SI is strictly positive. This should be true for any I from 1 to K. We want that the sum of these weights QI is sum up to 1. And we also know, want to know, or oh, want to know from that measure Q that the conditional expectation of X11 one and uh, so f of x1 given f0 is equal to x0 and this we can write down explicitly it's simply that sum over here namely s uh, um, little si divided by 1 plus r times qi and you see now we have here a linear equation namely we have k are now that is q1 up to qk and we have here two equations so and you see in case that um, linear uh, system has a solution then we know the solution is unique if and only if k is equal to 2 in case k is larger than 2 if we have a solution, then there will be infinitely many solutions. So what's the message of that example is the following. So far, we addressed the question of uh, whether the set of equivalent martingale measures is empty or non-empty. And here we see that in case it is non-empty, it might be that there are infinitely many um, equivalent martingale measures. So uniqueness is nowhere claimed in these statements so far. And this example clearly shows that uniqueness need not to be held true. Okay, so after having discussed that, let us now come to the, to the most important theorem, and that's the so-called fundamental theorem of asset prices. And it states the following. So consider a financial market model 
denoted by S bar, which should be uh, consist of one risk free security and D risky securities. And this financial market model is defined on our uh, favorite filter probability space omega f FTP. And here the assumptions from the beginning um, um, should hold true, meaning uh, that f naught here denotes simply the trivial sigma algebra. And then the following are equivalent. So our financial market model is arbitrage free and which is equivalent to the fact that um, the set of equivalent martingale measures is non-f. So one direction of the proof we already have seen, namely that b implies a, this was simply the statement of theorem 2.8. So let us now come, come to the proof of that a indeed implies b. And here we will perform an Proof by induction over capital T. So in the base score of this induction uh, when T, capital T is equal to 1, this was exactly the statement of the previous theorem 2.9. So that's done. So we only have to worry about the induction step from T minus 1 to T. So the first observation is here the following. So if our financial market model um, with which we started is arbitrage free, then it also implies that the financial market model on the time horizon 1 to capital T, so 0 is taken out, is also arbitrage free. So by induction hypothesis, we then know, since this consists only on, of T, capital T minus 1 time points, and uh, that's the existing uh, equivalent measure Q1 defined on our probability space omega f or on that measurable space omega f such that the random variables xt are integrable with respect to Q1 for any little t between 1 and capital T and the martingale pro uh, property holds true under that measure Q1 for any t in that interval uh, 1 up to capital T minus 1. We also know that this one period financial market model S0 and S1 is arbitrage free and we would like to uh, view that model on the probability, on that filtered probability space omega f, uh, f0, s1 chosen as filtration with respect to the measure q1. So by theorem 2.9, uh, we also know that there exists an uh, equivalent measure Q0, which is equivalent with respect to Q1, which has bounded density. So this was the assertion of the theorem 2.9. And uh, such that the following holds true, namely that X0 and X1 are uh, integrable with respect to uh, Q0 and that the uh, martingale property holds true, namely that the condition expectation of x1 given f0 under this measure Q0 is equal to x0, Q0 almost truly. So our task now is to come up with a candidate which should be our equivalent martingale measure. And for that purpose, I would like to define a measure Q on omega f in the following way. Q of the event A is simply defined as the expectation with respect to the measure P of the indicator function of the set A of the following product of densities, namely the density um, Q0, uh, dQ0 by dQ1 times the density d q1 by dp. And obviously by definition uh, q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. So what we should convince ourselves that we also know that q is equivalent to p. So what do we know? So we know first of all that q1 is equivalent to p by assumption 
or by the construction of Q1. We also know that Q0 is equivalent to Q1 by construction. Hence, by theorem 1.8, we know that the density of uh, Q0 with respect to Q1 is strictly positive. Uh, Q1 almost surely, and since Q1 is equivalent to P, we also know that this holds true P almost surely. We also know that Q1, the density of Q1 with respect to P is strictly positive P almost surely. And hence, this implies that the density of Q with respect to P, which is nothing else but the product of these two densities, is positive P almost surely. Hence, we can again apply a theorem 1.8 and conclude that indeed Q is equivalent to P. So we have found now an equivalent measure. So is that a martingale measure? So for that we have to check two things, namely that the random variables xt are integrable with respect to q and that the martingale property holds true. So let us focus first on the integrability. So let us write down what is the expectation under q of the random variable modulus of xit. This is nothing else by definition as the expectation under P of the random variable modulus xit multiplied by this density. So now we can distinguish two cases. So if t is in a uh, takes value 0 or 1, then you can rewrite that expectation over here simply as the expectation under Q0 of that random variable x i t and by the properties of Q0 we know that that quantity over here is finite. On the other hand if t takes values in the, in the set 2 up to capital T we rewrite that expectation over here in terms of the expectation with respect to the measure Q1 of the following product, namely the modulus of the random variable xit times the density of Q0 with respect to Q1. But we know by the previous theorem that um, this density is bounded. So hence that expectation um, is not affected by that additional random variable because it's bounded. We can use the upper bound and take that out from the expectation, and in that way, it falls then from the properties of that random uh, of this probability measure Q that these random variables are finite. Hence, we have convinced ourselves that indeed x t is an error Q for any t. Let us now come to the Martingale property. As the proof is rather similar. So we first consider the time point t equal to zero. So we take any set A from our sigma algebra F0, and then we do the following computation. So we compute the expected value under Q of the indicator function of A times this random variable x1. So then let us rewrite or plug in the definition of this measure Q, which gives rise to the following expectation under P of the indicator function of the event A times this random variable x1 times this product of densities. So now you see I can rewrite that expression over here in terms of the expectation with respect to Q0. So then I can simply use the fact that I can, by definition, that I can write this the expectation of um, the resulting product between the indicator function of A and the random variable x1 as the conditional expectation of these two objects given F0. But I, since A is um, a set taken or an event taken from F0, I know that that function over here is F0 measurable, so I can take that out and then I can use the martingale property with respect to that measure Q0, which then gives me simply x0. So I end up with the um, expectation under Q0 of the indicator function of A times x0, and then I can rewrite everything in terms of uh, this measure P, 
which is then nothing else but um, the indicator function of a times x naught times that density. And this I can then rewrite back in terms of the expectation of that random variable under this measure q. And by a similar reasoning, I can also consider for any t in the set 1 to capital T minus 1 and a in the sigma algebra ft, the following expected value, and a means expected value under q, of the indicator function of the set a times the random variable x t plus 1. So again, applying the definition of this measure q, I can rewrite everything in terms of the expectation under this measure p times this density. Now I can first rewrite everything in terms of the expected value under this measure q1. And then I'm left with the product of the following two terms, the indicator function of a, the random variable x t plus 1, and this density of q0 with respect to q1. And now I use properties of the conditional expectation, that means that I can also rewrite that in terms of the expectation of the conditional expectation. And here and now I would like to do the following. You see, a is chosen from the sigma algebra ft, meaning the indicator function of a is an ft measurable function. I can take that out from the condition expectation due to the properties of measurable factors. Moreover, I know that this density over here is uh, measurable with respect to f1. Hence, I can also take that out from the conditional expectation. And then I can apply the martingale property of, uh, on the resulting conditional expectation by, because by definition of this measure q1, I know that this conditional expectation is equal to the um, random variable xt. So and then I can rewrite everything again in terms of this probability measure p, and having that density, I can rephrase it in terms of the expected value with respect to q. And now I can apply the uniqueness of the conditional expectation to conclude that indeed um, the um, um, Martingale property holds true under this measure q. And this concludes then the um, induction step.